going to say that uh, I'm going to show off with a lot of great numbers about how, uh, how quickly we became successful and everything, but just to preface it, you know, we're still a very young company. Uh, you know, being here at, uh, uh, as a guest of Bonnier, a company that exists for 200 years and achieved so much, uh, we are really in early stage of our journey. And the other thing I want to talk about is that the success of PlayBuzz is actually my own personal devastating failure. So I'll tell you all about that in a second, but first a little bit about uh, my past life. So uh, I'm originally from Israel. This is where I was uh, born and raised. And I've been living the majority of my adult life in the United States. I uh, first came to New York to attend uh, university. I did my master's degree in interactive te telecommunication in New York University. And then stayed in New York for a few more years to uh, develop my career. Um, for a few years, I was the vice president of uh, digital product at MTV Networks, which was a really inspiring and uh, gratifying uh, career opportunity. And after a few years in that role, my wife and I decided that it's time to go back and uh, raise our family in Israel. My idea of going back to Israel was that, uh, you know, I won't have to work too hard and I can really spend the majority of my time sitting on the couch doing nothing but play video games, which is, you know, what I think life should be about. Uh, my wife, unfortunately, has a bit of a different perspective on life, and she falsely interpreted my laziness as a sign of a midlife crisis, and she diagnosed that the only way to rescue me of my midlife crisis is to enroll me back in the jobs market. So um, I looked around and tried to find a suitable job in playing video games uh, full-time. Unfortunately, uh, there wasn't any uh, job posting of that nature. So I tried to poke around and see what are my different career opportunities. And Israel, as some of you know, is also known as the startup nation. There. There are more startups per capita in Israel than anywhere else in the world. Uh, only last year alone, more than 3.5 billion US dollars were invested just in Israeli startups. I always say that uh, you know, if entrepreneur was a listing in the yellow pages, it would need its own volume, because pretty much everyone in Israel, you know, what they do is they start their own company. So I did a little bit of research on what it means to start your own company, and this is what I gathered. The model works as follows. More than 95% of startups are failing. So somebody creates a company. Uh, for a couple of years, they develop a product that sounds pretty good on paper. But by the time it's ready, it turns out that nobody really wants it. And definitely, nobody's willing to pay for it. And then the company gets shut down. And then it's a little known fact. The entrepreneur that started the company is becoming really, really depressed. And they are entitled for about two years of doing nothing but sitting on the couch and playing video games. So, um, you know, I figured that this is actually in line with my career objectives and that uh, I should start my own company. And the plan was really to, um, you know, build something, spend a couple of years developing it, and then seeing it through failure and bankruptcy and be entitled for uh, two years of uh, PlayStation Paradise. Uh, that was the plan. And every company, you know, when you start a company, you first need an idea. And my idea was really simple. I, uh, I figured, you know how we all, we're all kind of suffering from reading fatigue. I mean, we all love content, we love media, we click on a lot of links and get to different websites. But then we're too exhausted to actually read a whole article. And uh, I figured, you know, if we can create a content platform that will enable people to author content in different formats that are more interactive, that are more uh, snackable, that are more visual, more adapted to, to social and to mobile media, then we can really increase engagement. And then publishers will really get great audience engagement and will be very happy. And I really thought it was a great idea. Unfortunately, I was the only one who thought it was a great idea. You know, I came to investors and, and spoke very um, uh, enthusiastically about the vision of uh, content being created and consumers all over the world paying attention and, and sharing and uh, enjoying it, and nobody understood what I was talking about. And then it struck me that I was trying to attack my audience with the wrong weapon. Investors don't need to know what they are investing in. You know, don't confuse them with too many facts and figures. In order to raise money, what you need to do is to use some generic images of millennials staring at their smartphone, 
and a couple of charts that are pointing to the upper right. It doesn't really matter what data they represent. You know, investors are really keen on those lines that are pointing upward and rightward, and, you know, that always gets their attention. And then in order to really seal the deal and get the investment, you need to show correlation between two data points. What data points, you know, could be completely arbitrary? Here is real data that is showing the ratio between the per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died by being tangled in their own bed sheets. <laughs> and when investors see that stuff, they immediately go like, oh my God, for 10 years there was such a correlation, you know, this guy is onto something, let's give him money. <laughs> so this is how Playbus got off the ground. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, got, uh, got its initial funding. And I built a budget that showed how uh, we're going to run out of money in April 2014, at which point we'll either raise more money or, according to statistics and in line with my business model, we'll go bankrupt and then I can, you know, uh, fulfill the purpose of this startup. Uh, this date, not incidentally, also coincided with the intended release of the new Call of Duty game. So uh, I had uh, a lot to look forward to, but first thing first, you know, I had to focus on work. So um, we rented a little tiny office in line with our budget, and I also hired a couple of people that uh, told me that they know how to write code. And I gave them very loose instructions on what this code uh, needs to create eventually. And while they were cramping in this little office space, I was cramping in an uh, economy class seat on flights, uh, mostly to the United States, to try and meet publishers and convince them to use this future platform we were developing. So I was putting my, uh, you know, my old bar mitzvah outfit, and uh, you know, usually I would have lunch with uh, some editor-in-chief or a product manager in some uh, big media company, and I would you know, tell them all about the great values of creating content with this platform we're creating. And just like in my experience with investors, they, have, you know, they had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And, you know, usually we would meet for lunch, and at some point they would excuse themselves, walk out, or I should say run out of the restaurant, leave me with the check. And, uh, you know, I thought things are going well. I mean, A, nobody's going to use our platform, so the company is going to be shut down. And B, with every such lunch, we got like 50 to $100 closer to running out of money. So everything was in line with my plan. And meanwhile, meanwhile in Israel, it turns out that you know, I was expecting my developers to do too much, and they told me that actually they're not going to have enough time to develop all those new interactive formats that uh, we envisioned. They only had time to develop one. They developed this uh, uh, format called Personality Quiz. You guys know those uh, online questionnaires that you're answering questions, and then it tells you uh, which Disney princess are you most like, or, you know, what's your uh, uh, life purpose? and whatever it is. So that was the format we developed, and with that we were supposed to go and uh, conquer the market. A few months before we were, uh, you know, when we got close to this running out of money date, my investors got a little nervous, and they asked me to cut cost. They said, if we'll cut the development cost down, we'll have more time to try and sell the platform to publishers. Now, gaining more time was not exactly in line with my career objectives, so I came up with an alternative plan. I said, people, instead of cutting costs, we're going to increase costs. We're going to double down. We're going to go all in. We're going to hire a content author that's going to create content using our own platform. And when publishers see the great content that can be created with Playbus, they'll all be convinced. It worked. You know, my investors were really, um, you know, really impressed by my dedication, my devotion, and my commitment to the company. So they approved me to hire this content author. And uh, this young, talented lady we, we hired started to create items, create personality quizzes using Playbuzz, and we would post them on Facebook. And they actually became pretty popular and started gaining traction, and so users would come to our website, and some of them would create their own content, and suddenly we had complete strangers creating content uh, with our platform. And before we knew it, it actually became successful. And there was this one horrible day on February 26, uh, 2014, only two months, when, uh, you know, two months away from running out of money, that this particular item, uh, personality quiz, quiz called Who Were You in a Past Life, that was created by some uh, uh, young woman from Oxford, England, gained more than 1.2 million likes on Facebook overnight, and ended up being one of the <laughs> top five most 
popular web pages of the year, uh, you know, globally. Uh, a few months later, it was announced that Playbus.com, that website we started merely as a showcase, as a marketing tool to try and convince publishers to use our platform, is the most shared website on Facebook uh, globally. And in fact, we had more traffic than all of those websites of publishers that we were trying to convince to use our system. Um, this did not escape the eye of the press, and suddenly our little startup was no longer a secret. Everybody in the industry was talking about it. And as a result, unfortunately, instead of running out of money, investors started pouring cash at us. And with this cash, we rented a much nicer office and 100 plus new employees. Unfortunately, some of these employees were pretty good at what they do. And so we developed, in, in addition to the personality quiz, we started to develop additional formats. And some of them were you know, goofy and funny and very shareable. And some others were more serious form of storytelling. And the results, the data showed us that this really works, that people are spending a lot of time on those pages. Uh, they actually complete them. They don't leave them in the middle. They share them on social media. So all of the data metrics really supported uh, the case that, uh, that we put up. So a lot of publishers saw what we're doing and said, these guys are successful. Let us you know, do whatever they do. And they started using our platform. So suddenly we had all those great publishers and others deploying our tools and creating new forms of storytelling using Playbuzz. And we're talking about you know, NBC, Fox, um, MTV, Time Magazine, different publishers from different verticals and different topics uh, from all over the world. We have now more than, uh, I guess, more than 10,000 active publishers using our platform every month. And a few months ago came the final nail in the coffin of my uh, uh, play PlayStation aspiration when, uh, when the Walt Disney Company invested in Playbuzz. And you know, once again, we got a lot of press traction because everybody wondered why the world's best media company is investing in you know, a bunch of cavemen from the Middle East. And uh, you know, that got uh, a lot of traction. And to make matters worse, not only did investors give us a lot of money, we started making our own money. And we let advertisers and brands use our tool set in order to create sponsored campaigns that are highly engaging and highly popular. And uh, as a result, uh, generated a revenue stream. We also created this analytic system that lets every content creator see exactly how their content is being consumed, what works, what doesn't. If somebody stops reading your article in the middle, at what point do they stop reading? And then how can you fix that to make sure that people do engage with your item in a, in a better way? And all of these tools that are now being used um, kind of industry-wide. Uh, that also, you know, that little cramped office in Tel Aviv, which I showed you, has uh, now evolved. We now have eight offices around the world, including our uh, newest and greatest one in China, uh, which I just came back from. And uh, with that, I stand in front of you today and have to admit complete failure in, uh, you know, in what the company uh, was meant, uh, meant to be and do. And it looks like there's going to be no video games for me uh, in the next couple of years. Now, with everything I just told and showed you, I, you know, I was only half serious, uh, but I was half serious because the reality is that success is one of those things that you can't really plan for. And you know, we wanted to do one thing and became successful for something completely different and then abandoned it and tried to reinvent ourselves. And you know, I constantly feel like we have to change our game and change our tactics. And I wanted to conclude five little things that were going throughout this uh, process, this, throughout this journey that I described to you that I think will give a good input to anybody that uh, wants to fail miserably at failing. So the first one is, you know, nobody really understood what we're talking about when we try to describe the potential virtues of our platform, but they all came in and started using us when they saw us using it and being successful with it. So, you know, really leading by example and eating your own dog food and going out there and, you know, being the user of your own platform was the best lesson I've learned. It's not so much about you know, trying to convince people with diagrams and numbers, convince them with success. Show them it works and they will follow. The second thing is, you know, we tried to develop like 15 different con formats of content and we ended up developing only one and it was a good thing because you know, we developed one but we, we developed it well. And when you focus on one thing and try to do it well, you have a better chance of migrating to the others than if you try to develop everything in advance 
and expect that any of it will actually uh, uh, hit a chord and become successful. The other thing is that uh, junior content author that we hired, you know, we didn't hire an experienced editor-in-chief or a big executive with a lot of experience. We hired a passionate, talented young lady, and we gave her the keys. And she became more successful. Uh, you know, today she is our VP of content, and she manages teams of uh, dozens of people worldwide. And, you know, you'll find out that if you build from the bottom up, and you don't try to hire someone who will then build the team under them to do the job, but hire someone to actually do the job, they'll not only be more successful, but they also have a higher likelihood of growing up to the part of being a big wig ex uh, executive as time goes by. Um, another thing is, uh, and you know, don't take the picture too literally, I have absolutely nothing against urinating in public spaces. I think, you know, it's, uh, I think it's great, but... Uh, <laughs> It's really, you know, don't get addicted to what's successful. So, you know, we became very successful as a standalone website, but we realized that, you know, rather than focus our business around that, we need to let it evolve and evolve to be a publishing platform. And when that became successful, we now evolved to be an advertiser platform. And, you know, what I'm saying is not abandon something when it works, but, you know, really understand that it's not so much about sticking to what works right now, but always continue to evolve and, and penetrate to other territories. And finally, look, the tactics, uh, whenever people ask me for advice on you know, how should they grow their business, I'm really clueless because all of my tactics uh, worked exactly the opposite of what I had in mind. But I think that at the end of the day, what makes you successful is that you stay true to your initial vision. We always we started the company with the intent of reinventing storytelling, of giving people the tools to create stories, to create content, to create media that is more engaging and more fun and more interesting. Everything else changed, you know, the product changed, the tactics changed, the market focus changed, the business model changed, but we always stay true to the vision. And when you stay true to the vision, you're embarking on a quest that you have no idea how it's going to end up, but, uh, and you have no idea where it's going to lead you on the way to where you'll get, uh, but at least you have a clear focus and a clear um, vision and understanding of where you're going to. Uh, with that, I thank you again for having me here today and um, uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, event. Thank you.